Good morning. Welcome to our worship celebration on this first day of the week. Uh, we're glad you've joined with us. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Last week we began looking at risky living. By the way, there is a difference between risky and reckless living. Dictionary definition of reckless is heedless or careless, headstrong or rash, indifferent or disregardful of consequences. Reckless is like the fly buzzing along one morning when he saw a lawnmower that someone had left in their front yard. He flew over and landed on the handle. As he sat there, he watched the children going down the sidewalk on their way to school. One little boy tripped over a crack and fell spilling his lunch on the sidewalk. He picked himself up, put his lunch back in the bag, and went on. But he missed a piece of bologna. Fly had not eaten that morning, and he was sure hungry. So he flew down and started eating the bologna. In fact, he ate so much that he could not fly. So he waddled across the sidewalk, crossed the lawn, up the wheel of the lawnmower, up the handle, and sat there resting and watching the children. There was still some bologna lying on the sidewalk. He was really stuffed, but that bologna looked oh so good. Finally, temptation got the best of him, and he jumped off the handle of the lawnmower to fly over to the bologna. But alas, he was too full to fly. And he went splat, killing him instantly. The moral of the story, don't fly off the handle when you're full of baloney. There's a dark side to us that's as reckless as the fly. It's not a matter of what the costs are. We just have to have it. Risky, on the other hand, is hazardous. It can involve certain uncertain danger, harm or loss. It can involve a, a chance of loss, chance of damage. Risky living involves entering in, knowing full well of the possible dangers. One of the most tragic events of the Reagan presidency was the Sunday morning terrorist bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, in which hundreds of Americans were killed or wounded as they slept. Many of us can still recall the terrible scenes as the dazed survivors worked to dig out their trapped brothers from beneath the rubble. A few days after the tragedy, Marine Corps Commandant Paul Kelly visited some of the wounded survivors then in Frankfurt, Germany, in a hospital there, severely wounded in the incident. Among them was Corporal Jeffrey Lee Nashton. Nashton had so many tubes running in and out of his body that a witness said he looked more like a machine than a man. Yet he survived. As the Commandant neared him, Nashton struggling to move and racked with pain, 
motion for a piece of paper and a pen. He wrote a brief note, passed it back to General Kelly. On the slip of paper were but two words, Semper Fi, the Latin motto of the Marine Corps, meaning forever faithful. Our military is a great example of understanding what risk means. Martin Luther was a man of risk. He risked his very life to stand firm on the Word of God. The signers of our Declaration of Independence were risk takers. And for the support of this declaration, they wrote, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. What are you willing to risk? What are you willing to do for the Lord? And this is the question we asked last week. It's a question that we need to continue to ask ourselves periodically. What am I willing to do? What am I willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to give up to stand firm, to show the Lord that I love him. And that's what it is, after all, showing the Lord that we love him. Last week we looked at the aspect of the bondage of family that can enslave us to the tyranny of ancestry prevent us from entering into a, a single relationship with our Heavenly Father. This principle was vividly illustrated in the Old Testament in our look at King Ahaz, who did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God as his father David had done. Remember, he set up stone altars. He sacrificed children to the evil spirits, even some of his own children. In the final years of his life, he was so obsessed with evil that he even took the sacred vessels from the house of the Lord, gave them to the enemy, gave them to the Assyrians. He nailed shut the doors of the temple and proclaimed it an offense punishable by death for anyone to worship Jehovah. Ahaz had a son. And at the age of 25, Hezekiah was crowned king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Hezekiah had turned from the ways of his father and developed a tremendous love, a deep love for God. His first official act was to open the doors of the house of the Lord, to repair the temple that his father had tried to destroy. Hezekiah risked everything, his crown, his future, his life. Hezekiah stood up to the evil that his father had inflicted on the nation he determined it was time to take a risk, to make a fresh start with God. Gathering the priests and the Levites together, he proclaimed, as we read last week from 2 Chronicles chapter 29, listen to me, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the house of the Lord your God the God of your fathers. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and have turned their backs. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his burning anger 
may turn away from us. This was an open declaration that he would not serve the gods of his father, but he would only serve the true and living God. The first six verses of 2 Kings explain in detail what Hezekiah did. If you turn in your Bibles with me, 2 Kings chapter 18, we'll begin with the very first verse. Now it came about in the third year of Hashia, the king of Ella, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And then verse 7 describes the result of that risk and the Lord was with him wherever he went he prospered and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him we've been talking about the tyranny of ancestry this morning I want us to look at the tyranny of tradition Ancestry and tradition are two bondages that prevent us from entering into a single relationship, into a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. Once these spiritual bondages were broken for Hezekiah, however, he was free. He was free to hear God in a way that no king had heard since David. He was able to institute many new reforms. So let's look at how Hezekiah broke from tradition. First of all, when the Levites could not get the temple purified in time for the April Passover, <laughs> Hezekiah changed the date. He changed the date from April to May, something no king or priest had ever dared to do before. Then second, not only that, but when it became obvious that people could not go through the lengthy but necessary purification rites in time to meet the Passover deadline, Hezekiah just simply lined them up and said, May the good Lord pardon anyone who determines to follow the Lord God of his fathers, even though he is not sanctified for the ceremony. Priests were horrified. They expected the young king to be struck at that very moment on the spot struck dead but to their amazement the Lord listened to Hezekiah's prayer 
and honored his enthusiasm. Having broken the tyranny of his father, he was also able to break the tyranny of senseless traditions. He was able to hear from God in a new way, and for a number of years, Hezekiah led his people to a fresh commitment to the Lord. What Hezekiah experienced is what we are able to experience today. We are on this side of the cross. In Jesus, we literally inherit a new ancestry. The old root, which formerly extended deep into our traditions, is hacked off. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now sends our roots deep, deep into the rich soil of the river of life. Once we are reborn into Christ, our ancestry, our heritage is traced to only one place, to the place of the cross. Our traditions are no longer bound in the old wineskins of the church, but take on the change of new wine. We are now joint heirs with the Son of God himself. I end this message the way I ended it last week. Are you a risk taker this morning? Are you willing to be bold and stand for what the Lord wants? Do you find yourself worshiping at false altars of money, athletics, success, unable to hear the voice of God? Are you up to risky living? Are you willing to break with the past, regardless of the cost, to make a fresh start? Are you ready? Jesus Christ was. He risked it all. His life. Isn't it time you risked yours for him?
At this time, we have a, a special occasion, and I would like uh, to invite Leland and Michaela to come forward. And you need to look that way. <laughs> it's a, a great pleasure to be able to announce to the congregation that Leland and McKaylin are engaged to be married. We celebrate with them. And, uh, and we're announcing it now because uh, this, at this time we are also going to install the two of them uh, as our new youth directors. And so I'm going to ask you to turn around and face me. Both of these young people have been uh, involved with our, our youth for quite some time. Uh, I've mentioned in the past that they uh, planned and orchestrated our retreat uh, at Sutter Creek uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they have just been very diligent uh, in their uh, serving in this ca capacity. And uh, they, uh, uh, through the years, uh, They've been together almost five years now uh, as a couple, but uh, it, during that time, they have also not only grown together uh, in their relationship, but they've grown in their relationship with the Lord. And so we're just delighted to, uh, to install them as our new youth directors at our Savior's Lutheran Church. So each of you has responded to God's call, to a responsible position of youth directors in this congregation. So I ask you, are you willing to the extent that God gives grace to first of all, uphold the word of God? Second, to be faithful in the study of his word so that you will be nourished? And third, to be a living example of God's word in your life? If so, answer, I will. Let's pray. Lord, not only do we rejoice in, in uh, their calling, your calling on their life, first of all to you, and now to a special direction in our congregation. I ask that you give them the grace to, to carry out their responsibilities. Uh, we just thank you for them. We thank you for their, their uh, listening to your call, to your voice, and we ask that you would just give, undergird them so that they will be able to, to accomplish what you have for them with our young people. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want you to, to just come together because I want to pray with you in another way. Thank you, Lord, for, for these two young people. We thank you for uh, how you brought them together. And uh, as they look forward to their future, Lord, we ask that you bless this time of engagement. Lord, just prepare them. Uh, for that time when they can become husband and wife. And we ask that you bless them in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <laughs> Dear Lord, we just thank you so much. We rejoice in who you are and how much you love us and how you provide for us. And you continue to do that. Lord, we just ask that we would be able to break, break with the tyranny of, of the ancestry, break with the tyranny of tradition. We get so caught up in what we've always done. And we find ourselves hesitant to break past because someone always says but we've never done it that way 
before. Lord, make us bold. Help us to take the risks that are necessary so that we can draw closer to you. Lord, this morning we're mindful of our dear brother Steve, as he has been, is in the process of being transferred to another hospital, and Lord, they are just not certain exactly what's going on and what's happening. We look to you, Lord, just, just to, to provide for him. Just touch him, give him strength, give him healing. Lord, and, and especially at this time, just give him patience to endure all the, the hospital red tape and paperwork. We trust you for, Lord, restoring him, his health, restoring him to us. And we pray for this morning also for Vivian, Lord, as, as guidelines have, have reduced family visitations to her English hopes. Lord, just continue to be with her, strengthen her, touch her, and, and Lord, just, just bring comfort to the family as their time with their mother has been drastically reduced. Just pray for your peace upon them. We thank you that we can join together in the prayer that you have given us, the sample prayer to lift before your throne of grace. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times, now and forever. Amen. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear?